Thank you so much, Kira. And hey, enterprise techies, welcome to our January New York Enterprise Tech Meetup, Gone Global. Today is extra special meetup for two reasons. First off, the NYTM turns nine years old today. It's been such an incredible journey so far, and we're so grateful to our vibrant suits and hoodies community across Fortune 500 IT execs, enterprise startup founders and operators, and investors of all stages for your support over 100 monthly meetups over the years. Secondly, today is special because we have our biggest name speaker to date. In partnership with Sequoia Capital, we're thrilled to have Octus co-founder and CEO Todd McKinnon joining us for a fireside chat to talk through their go-to-market journey along multiple phases of the company's life. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm John Lair, and along with my co-founder Jessica Lynn, we're co-founders and general partners at Workbench. Workbench is an enterprise VC fund based here in New York City. Our sweet spot for investment is live products early on their go-to-market journey. And this generally corresponds to leading C2 rounds in the three to $6 million range. We are obsessed with all things go-to-market here. And you'll see this reflected in our speakers, our keynotes, and our panels. Kicking off today's meetup, we're excited to welcome Gene Yang, founder and CEO of Kita Software. But before we begin, just a few quick reminders. First of all, our hashtag is NYETM for New York Enterprise Tech Meetup. Be sure to tweet away and tweet often. Uh, second, you can view all videos from past meetups on the Workbench YouTube page. We'll have today's session posted probably tomorrow as well. And in both Gene's demo and the talk with Todd, we'll leave question, time for Q&A. So please use the chat to ask questions and uh, we'll try to get to them all. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gene, to kick us off. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I've never opened for, uh, for, for the CEO of Okta before. So this is a great, uh, great, great uh, opportunity. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And um, I will just kick off my, uh, my demo. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop. And uh, let me know, I guess, uh, if, if anything is not visible, but um, cool. So today we're gonna talk about how to catch breaking changes better. And so I've heard that this is a pretty dev tools um, enthusiastic crowd. And so you probably know that modern programming is APIs. So maybe you maintain an API yourself. You probably use a lot of other APIs and this probably makes your life easier in a lot of ways. But what we hear from developers over and over again is APIs mean developer pain. And the main reason is because any code change could break any other service in a number of non obvious ways. And it's often not even clear which other services your code change can affect. And the code changes can be as small as a field type change, like really, really little stuff that at the application level, a type checker should have caught. Um, and so when I heard that this was the state of the world, I left academia to solve this problem. So I was previously a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I have since assembled a small team experienced in building innovative programming tools. We have been building the uh, future of cloud observability. And so what do we do? Uh, Akita aims to help you catch breaking changes better by watching API traffic and giving developers structured behavioral diffs. What this means is, like other observability tools, we watch API traffic. That's kind of the meaning of observability. Unlike other tools, we are also able to run in tests, uh, giving de devs the option of shifting DevOps left. And unlike other observability tools, we're building structured models of what's going on across your APIs. So we're building structured models of individual services um, in the form of annotated API specs. And we're also working towards building structured models of the entire interaction graph across your APIs. And what we do with those is give API behavioral diffs back to the developer to aid in finding and fixing breaking changes faster. And because our models are just API specs, they're not some kind of black box machine learning model, you can actually diff them against handwritten specs or ones generated by um, a framework or, or anything else. 
And so now I'm going to show a quick demo that's going to work up to what a behavioral diff looks like in Akita. And so um, first I'm just gonna show um, really quickly what it means for Akita to watch traffic. And so Akita, um, uses an agent to watch traffic wherever you have traffic test production. Um, we can also work with HAR files from your browser. Um, so I've just thrown up a little service called Akibox. It's a file sharing system. Um, and what I'm gonna do is set up Akita to listen to traffic to Akibox. So you can run Akita from the command line. All you need to do is um, invoke it this way. You can also invoke it from CI or from, um, from your production deployment from anywhere. And then I'm just going to send some traffic to Akibox so that um, Akita can use that to generate a spec. We can go back and now we're ready to look at the API model that Akita inferred. And so let's just go and look here. And so what we have here is uh, the Akita agent has taken the 79 requests that we sent and built a model with six endpoints. And there's one kind of sensitive data email. And so here's a summary of all the endpoints. As you can see, Akita is able to collapse the path arguments. And then um, Akita also uh, is able to infer fine grained data types. So here it's, um, it, it inferred that it picked up date time RFC 3339. Um, you're also uh, able to download the spec as a YAML file and do other things. But what I'm going to show now is how we're going to use Akita to catch a uh, behavioral diff. And so um, I guess I, I can't see any of you. And so I hope you're saving your questions for the Q&A portion if you have them. Sorry if I'm, I'm going too fast. Um, there's like no feedback from the room. Um, but um, so something that we've heard from developers over and over again is we ask them, you know, what's your nightmare scenario from a time your site went down? And we thought we'd hear like, oh, there's this big thing, but it was often things like we changed a data format and then our site was down for like half a day or we, we renamed a few and then things were really bad. And so what I'm going to show you is we're just going to accidentally change uh, this user phone number data format from uh, international to US. And so um, as, um, as you can see, this is like a three character change. This might be buried in like a huge other code commit. And um, it might not look like a big deal here, but if you actually change your phone number data type, this is gonna interfere with your parsing. This is gonna interfere with a bunch of other stuff. And so I'm gonna show how Akita can flag this at um, commit time now so that you, um, uh, you can catch this before it reaches your users, takes your site down, what have you. So um, as you can see, I'm making this code change in this um, NYETM demo branch. I'm going to make a commit based on this now. Uh, changing some code. And then um, what I'm showing you here is Akita's GitHub integration. And so, like I said, um, you can run us in test, you can run us in prod. Um, and so how a lot of people run us is actually just um, in their CI on every commit. Um, and, uh, and then what we, um, and, and then Akita leaves comments showing what changed. And so this is actually going to run in CI. So I'm not gonna wait and do this cause I only have five minutes for my demo. Um, so I'm going to show a previous version of this where I floated it before. And so here's, um, so this is 109. I, this is the one I ran right before. Um, and so here what Akita does is it left a comment saying, hey, uh, you changed some stuff. There's one endpoint change, the user's endpoint, as we expected. And um, you added a US phone number and removed an international phone number. And there's an exclamation point because these are sensitive data types. But now the developer or a code reviewer can look at this and see if this is what they intended to do. And if someone's like, hmm, I, want, I wonder what's going on, you can actually dig in in the Akita console 
and it shows the user's endpoint change. That's why it's yellow. They're also red and green for added and removed. And you dig in there and it says, well, this is, this is where it changed on um, this line in the spec, allowing uh, developers or anybody else to go in and make the change if they need to. So um, this is, I'm probably over time. So I'm just gonna put up this slide um, uh, and see if there are questions, but I'll end by saying, um, at Akita, we're still super early, so our private beta is available now. Uh, thank you to all the users who've been giving us feedback so far. We're planning to release a public beta at the end of the quarter. And uh, we would love if you are struggling with breaking changes, um, especially um, in, in your service-oriented systems, uh, to try out our private beta, give us feedback so we can help, um, so you can help us help you catch your breaking changes better. Thanks. So I believe it's the Q&A part now. Um, should I stop my share? Or? Yeah, so I think we have time for one quick question if anyone has one. I didn't see any come through in chat yet. Cool, but Jean, if you also want to um, pop your- Oh, here's oh, one, we have Kira. One question, yep. Um, Jean, thanks for this. Do you see any use cases beyond developers? Um, say, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for the question. Um, so I didn't uh, demo this uh, this path of usage, but we're actually able to document any API. So if you have a vendor API, as long as you're able to generate what's called a HAR file. Um, so this is something you could do either through a proxy or um, just your Chrome, like any, like most, most web browsers have it. Um, we can actually ingest that and give you APIs and then diff on those. So I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that if you're interested. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jean. Could you also um, pop some of your contact information into the chat in case people also want to contact you there? Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Jean. Um, and Jess, I think it's time for you and Todd. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am so, so pumped today to be speaking with Todd McKinnon, co-founder and CEO of Okta who started the company back in 2009, took it public in 2017, and has completely reinvented how we think about cloud identity and access management today. But before we dive in, uh, for those of you who have joined us for a New York Enterprise Tech Meetup before, you know we always kick off with a signature icebreaker, uh, and we, uh, we have a new one for you today. So for those of you who follow Todd on Twitter, you may have picked up that he is bit of a fitness fanatic, uh, 142 workouts posted on Instagram in 2020. So Todd, what is still on your fitness bucket list this year? Um, I just try to stay healthy. I mean, like don't get injured. <laughs> I yeah. actually hurt my knee. I hurt my knee last year. I've been kind of nursing a knee injury. So um, I saw the, ice. it's also, the icing was also part of the, the stat. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, I, and, and then the CrossFit season starts in a couple, uh, like eight weeks. So then I'll be in the CrossFit season again for the CrossFit Open. And so, yeah, be a busy year. Awesome. Well, Kelly on our team is going to try to do an Ironman this year. So we're going to volunteer him up to join you. <laughs> That's a long way. Ironman's a long way. <laughs> so let's get into it then. Um, here at Workbench, we are obsessed with enterprise sales and go-to-market. Uh, something we see day in and day out our startups, truthfully, just how brutally hard enterprise sales can be. Um, and one of the things I really admire about you, Todd, from all of your interviews and your writing is just how honest you've been about this entire journey, right? Of course, we only see the IPO and the growth and the great press, uh, but it sounds like there were also a few ups and downs to get here today. So we're really grateful to you and founders who keep it real. And what we're going to focus on specifically today is Octo's first customer, Octo's 10th customer, and Octa's 50th customer and all of the lessons learned. So uh, top customer number one, I feel like the first customer is always a special one. You know, <laughs> like many of our founders here at Workbench, you're a technical founder, right? So you previously ran all of engineering and Salesforce. You didn't come from a traditional sales background. So what was that like starting out with limited enterprise sales experience? Um, yeah, it, and thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about this stuff. It's uh, it is challenging and it's cool to talk about it. I, just for I I worked as you said I worked at Salesforce, so I came into 
running Okta as with a technical background and at Salesforce, I was running engineering. So it was like a kind of a leadership and, a, you know, growing up from technical background. And then before that, I worked at a company called PeopleSoft where I was a developer and um, engineer growing up through there. So um, the one, the reason that's relevant just to, so you know a little bit about me, um, but also for this conversation is that it's not by accident that I started. Uh, so it was a deliberate, um, plan to start a company where that background would give me an advantage, not, not just, not just in the ability to build the product, but in that, like selling the first 10 customers, because the first 10 customers of a company is, as everyone knows, or a lot of it's like evangelism, <laughs> you know, you're trying to convince the customers to do something that's totally different, totally radical. If it's not totally different, totally radical, why would they, they would just go to like Oracle or IBM, right? Like, why would they even talk to you? Um, so it's this, something that's totally radical, totally new. And you have to be able to gain credibility with them so they would trust you for this. And in our case, the, the crazy part of it was um, that it was gonna be security from the cloud. It was like, not just like some business app where you would yeah. put your business app on, it's gonna be security. So the fact, it was a lot of evangelism, especially in the first 10 and that was, I had the advantage that I'd, you know, somewhat been involved in building Salesforce and had talked to a bunch of customers from that experience. So I had somewhat credit, even if it wasn't like, how relevant was that to like, should they really trust me to build this thing? But it <laughs> gave me that credibility. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, in the early days, what was really key is that you guys were actually able to hone in on that number one customer pain point pretty quickly, right? Which was how to securely manage users given the rise of cloud solutions. But I think even knowing that first, that number one problem, how did you go out and close that first customer, which was uh, exactly right? Yeah, yeah. You're so nice. Like you were worried I forgot, huh? <laughs> I'm like, just as a reminder, that $400, that was a $400 deal, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, that is burned in my mind. I'll never forget that. I, so one thing that we, I think is a good approach, it's I, a, lot, a lot of these approaches for early company building are, you know, there's lots of different, um, nothing's the exact right approach because there's always nuances and different products and different markets are different. But for us, I think one thing that worked well was being very customer driven and um, kind of following this process of customer development and market development. And so for that, what that meant for us is that uh, we read this book, my co-founder and I, Freddie Karras, when we started working together, we read this book called Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, it's by Stephen Blank. It's kind of a, it kind of was a precursor to like a lean startup. Um, I think a lean startup, that book, Eric, in that book kind of combined some different ideas, but a big part of that is customer development. But yeah, we read this book and it's, it's kind of, out, it was aligned with our philosophy and we followed a lot of the practices, which is customer development, like very early on, show your customers what you're going to build and get their feedback on it. Yeah. It actually led, that actually led to us pivoting the company. Like before we started Okta, which was, you know, identity management, we had a different idea, which was around systems monitoring and management, like a systems, like a reliability monitoring service uh, for cloud apps. And that, because of customer development and talking to people about that idea, we actually pivoted to being um, identity management. And once the great thing about it is once we pivoted, like if you look at the mockups we created, right after we pivoted, you know, six months into the journey, they, they look similar to the product today. I mean, obviously it's grown a lot, but it's the, the basic concepts are the same. So my point is that the, 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 we were doing this customer development. And then the other thing is that we wanted to get product into market very quickly. So exactly when they first became, when they became our first customer, it barely worked. I mean, it was <laughs> very minimal. And, but we did sign them up for that grand sum of $400, um, you know, relatively quickly. It was six months into the, into the company, or it was like six months after we raised our first seed round. Um, so we, it was very minimal. We got, we got a lot of good feedback in terms of what was working, what wasn't. And um, I think too, it was like a, a, maybe more valuable than anything. It was like a, 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 like a mental milestone. Right. So for me and for my co-founder and for the, you know, we had five or six employees at the time, it was like, we, we proved to ourselves we could do it because the hardest thing about the early days, like a lot of people know on this, on the zoom is that it's, it's a mental thing. It's like, you got to believe in it, even when you don't believe, you know, like, you know, all the odds are against you. And 
you gotta muster up that belief even when maybe you know the, the things aren't going great and, and there's really no logical reason to believe. Right. And I think getting a customer is is a huge step, even if it is a minimal viable product and the customer barely adopts you, it's like that milestone is powerful. Yeah, and, and getting that on the books, right? And I think the thing I had also read was that your your first idea around cloud reliability was really the number four pain point. Right, but it wasn't the number one. And that's yeah. the thing that we say all the time at Workbench. You gotta be as close to the number one pain point for your buyer, because if you're anything below four or five, right? Like it probably won't get done in a large enterprise. Yeah, and that's, and in, in, you know, like in the customer development process, that's part of the nuance of it because it's pretty unlikely that your idea is gonna be so bad that they're gonna be like, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> yeah, right? the middle is the hard part, right? Where you're only, yeah. And of course, so that means a lot of stuff's in the middle. It's like, oh yeah, I could see this. And so there's some subtlety in, in interpreting the feedback. The feedback might be, oh yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, I would use that if I had enough apps. That sounds okay. It sounds lukewarm. Human nature is to be like, okay, it's decent. I'm onto something. Positive, what yeah. that, let me translate that for you, Jessica. This idea is stupid. <laughs> so you got to be able to read that. And for us, you know, we, we kind of kept poking around until this identity thing kept coming up. And the scary part about it is even identity was not like banging on the table. We have to have this. It, but it was a strong enough signal that combining that with some of my past experience and knowing that identity could be valuable and we could build a big company around it, that was enough to make the judgment call to go for it. That's awesome. Well, let's fast forward to customer 10, right? Because yeah. I think that's when it starts to get really fun. It's hard and you get, you're getting a lot more data points. And I think in your case, Okta actually started out by tackling small, medium-sized businesses first, right? Because you saw that, that go-to-market motion at Salesforce, but then you actually came to realize that the bigger companies were actually the ones that felt this pain point the most acutely. They were the ones who had the most applications. So how did you ultimately find that sweet spot of customers? And then the very quick follow-up question is that the paradox here that so many of our startups face is that while you do want to sell into large companies, you're still seen as a small company. So how did you make yourself seem bigger than you were? How do you get that trust and validation from prospective customers? Um, that was like seven questions. <laughs> I pack them in. I like it. That was just like rapid. If you get someone, that'll be great. Beautiful. Um, so I think the last thing, the last question you asked there, how do you how do you appear substantial? Part of it in the early days is um, ironically, I, I think that your advantage is that you're not substantial. Your advantage can be that you're you have credibility. There's something about you personally, because you're evangelizing. So your advantage can be that you, you're you have some it's something in your background or something in, you're passionate about to solve this problem for the customer. And because you're not big, the buyer knows that you're going to jump over hoops for them. Or, you know, when they say jump, you're going to say how high and you're going to run through walls for them and just use that to your advantage. I mean, the first, the first 10 customers, you can do that. So don't think that you have to be like, sometimes people try to emulate their old company, right? You know, we couldn't be Salesforce. We were nothing. So we had to like, just make it really clear that, hey, we think we, we, th we have a strong conviction we can build this. We have a decent start and we will run through walls for you. And that resonates with the buyers at these companies because every other vendor is like, you know, some salesperson and some director of sales and some G GM. But for with Octo is like, hi, here I am. What do you need? Yeah, I think the uh, there is so much advantage to, to some disadvantages, right? And and tied. And then to the that, other thing that Jessica, sorry, the other thing that popped into my mind was um, obviously that's relatively early when you can do that. Um, but then one thing we were super uh, focused on is like customer references and reference selling. You know, people used to laugh at our website because I think every customer we signed up had a full produced video testimonial on there. <laughs> And pretty soon it became comical because there was, you know, we had a 200 customers, there was like 200 video testimonials. Um, but we knew that that like, it's a social thing, right? Especially these, a lot of these tough sledding in the early days of enterprise go to market. It's people want proof of that they're making the right decision. And there's no better proof than there's another company that's doing it. And their peers in the industry are, are going with the solution. So we just plastered that all over the place and encourage customers to, or prospects to talk to customers and customers to talk to prospects. 
Yeah, there is that threshold, right? That we see in the enterprise at the end of the day. It's like, if I see all the other banks using it, then I am much more likely to do it with that social proof. Um, I'm curious about pricing, right? Because I think I've read that in the past, you said that a common mistake for younger companies, of course, is to not charge enough or to not be confident enough about the value they're delivering. So yeah. was there an inflection point at Okta that gave you the confidence to go out and charge more? And how did you nail what that pricing should be? Um, we, so the, I mean, the confidence is, the confidence is gradual. Um, you know, like you don't, you build confidence by getting bigger and bigger deals and um, figuring out the market and figuring out the competitor's pricing. So it's a gradual thing. I would say that back to what I previously answered about the value you can provide just being a entrepreneur or a senior leader that is focused on jumping through or running through walls for that buyer, that's valuable. And people forget that sometimes. So it's like that buyer is going to get something from you. And it might not even be the product. It might be just your expertise in this area, right? It might just be your expertise and identity. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, and there's a reason, there's an advantage to being agile and flexible and responsive to the buyer. Um, and so you can get money and get pricing for those early deals, which is more valuable than the money. It starts to become a signal that you build your next generation of pricing on. I remember when we started, we, 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 just, got, we just started charging $25 per user per month, right? And it's kind of, we kind of made it up, but we, we started getting signal and we got feedback and people would be like, wait, Gmail is $50 a user a year. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh. I'd be like, well, you know, we're valuable in the back of my mind. I'd be like, oh, I didn't think of that. That's a good point. <laughs> but you get, you, my point is you iterate, right? Um, and, and you, you know, you do things like you, you iterate on the price point, but you also probably more relevant, you, you um, iterate on uh, like modules and what, what modules should be grouped together and what customers want to buy together and what they want to buy separately and what they want a la carte and what are the competitive dynamics. So I would say it's a, it's, it's a pricing is a big iteration. And in the early days, as you get that feedback cycle going, you can charge more than you can think more than you think you can. And a lot of that's just because there's valuable to working with you. There's valuable to your team is valuable because you probably have a lot of super hard charging capable people out there in the field with the customer people that it's going to be hard for that customer to hire so that they get value in just working with those people. Yeah. I think that's a good reminder um, that to even hear from you in the early days, right? Octa had to test a lot of pricing to get to where it is today. I think related to pricing is that often we see our companies feeling like there's some sort of a ceiling on pricing due to competitors, right? So I guarantee every founder on this call right now has either one, you know, legacy incumbents they're up against. So in your case, you know, it was Microsoft and Oracle, uh, two, either next gen or newer players competing or three, all of the above, right? So I'm curious how Okta took on both legacy and also newer competitors. And what were your sales team's conversations like in those early days? having to position yourself against those other players? I, um, so one thing is, one thing is like, you have to be, if you're gonna, if this is about iteration and discovery and like figuring out the landscape. Um, one of the things you have to do is you have to walk away. Like you have to be willing to lose a deal to get good signal. Yeah, you have to be. But that's, that's like, that's painful. And I, we weren't great at this. Like we, I think we, one mistake we made is, is we would take a deal at any cost too much, um, which is not the right approach. We should have walked away more and learned more. We tended to walk away when we, we, we didn't meet all the needs, but we didn't walk away just because the competitor was pricing too low. We should have done that more. We would have gotten more signal about what people truly valued in us and how it was unique. Um, so that's one thing. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of competition, you you have to. Um, there's there's people that their whole career is like competitive selling and selling process and setting value and selling to value. The one thing that worked well for us was um, was getting out of the of the features and functions, speeds and feeds, checklist selling. Yeah. Um, and for for me, with a technical background and a 
engineering mindset and a product mindset. It was always about like, you know, how many features do we have? How many apps do we have integrated? Do we do this kind of new protocol? That's better. Just tell the customer that and charge more. But what we found is that it's, it's really about, um, it's not about that. If you want to be able to have a strategic sale and a high value sale, the right way to do it is figure out, and we would, we like went through a whole phase where we trained the sales team on this and had a consultant come in and help us do this, which was put yourself in the, in the buyer's perspective and what do they value and speak in that language through the whole sales process. So that when the inevitable competition comes in from Microsoft or these other companies, smaller companies, whatever, about you know how they're going to do it for less, you can go back to that. But wait a minute, we agreed that your objective is to move faster with the other applications you're trying to roll out. And you agreed that that was worth this much money. So let's just do this. It's not Microsoft, first of all, are they even, can they deliver the value? Like, is that, have you talked to them about that? Have you agreed on that? Um, so it's like iterating, trying new things on the sales, on the pricing, but then also putting yourself in the buyer's shoes and, and framing the whole thing from the objectives they're trying to solve. And then when the competition inevitably comes, you can defend it better because you're like defending what they want to do. You're not defending what you want to do as a vendor. Yeah. No, I'm so glad you, you bring up saying no to, to customers who are not good for you. Um, and the reality that we see is just in the early days, right? Every customer feels so precious. Um, and you talked about this really publicly. And I'm really grateful you did about, you know, 2011, a year that you had said, you know, was physically painful for you, you know, missing numbers. Um, and, and that's, I think, something inevitable that almost every startup has to, has to at some point face. So can you just share a little bit about that time and what it took for you and your team to get past that? Well, it was, um, so you, you mentioned earlier about like the first customer, the 10th customer and like 50th or 100th. Um, so 2011 for us was a, a really tough year. And it was, it was basically between like, we had a couple customers, but we needed to get to 10, right? That was, it was like that, um, that valley, that kind <laughs> that of valley, a valley of death. Um, and you know, it was the time period we started in 2009 and it was, so it was like, we'd been around long enough to where we, the expectations were starting to rise from investors and employees and just in general, like, right. The employees, families, like, how's it going? Do you have a thousand, do you have a hundred customers yet? Right. Um, but we hadn't really been long around long enough to figure all this stuff out. So it was that kind of that awkward period between starting and really starting to scale. So it was a tough year. And I think that um, we, the main thing that, the main thing that um, I think we did well as a leadership team is I changed, I changed my style as a leader. Um, and it was, remember, I'd come from big company. I, I'd come from more of a mindset and a, where kind of the leader had the answers, right? And the leader thought about the strategy and then kind of told the group what to do. And in a company where all these things I've talked about, it's been iteration and it's been discovery and it's been learning, that doesn't work. Like you can't, the leader doesn't know, right? The leader kind of has a vision and a direction, but the deep, oh man, it's like, we got so much to figure out. I can't figure it out. I'm not out there talking to customers. I don't. And so that was a big change I made. It was like, open up, just expose all the problems to the company. We had about, I think we had about, you know, 30 people at the time, maybe 40 people. And it was like, we got problems. Here was our forecast. Here's where we are. And then like share the problems, which feels counterintuitive. It feels like you don't want to share that because that means everyone's going to know you, you, the leader doesn't know all the answers. And that means people are going to get freaked out and maybe want to leave and not lose confidence. But the ironically, the exact opposite happened. It was energizing to people because everyone's like, oh, this is like, we got problems. I got to pitch in to fix it. And I have all this information now. I can maybe help fix it so let's rally and and what we ended up what i ended up rallying the company on is like just i want five customers live and deployed right so i think we had you know exactly and a couple more signed up we have to just get a few more companies to and we had a, a bunch of deals sold we probably had 10 or 15 deals sold but it was like get five live at scale yeah. because if we do that then i know we can get 50 right right if, and if, and because it proves we can do it. Plus they're going to be references. And so, you know, and that change in leadership style, the, the, um, 
the product was getting better. A lot of things were happening. It's not always just one thing, black and white. The product was getting better. The market, which is probably the most significant thing, Jessica, is that the, the, there was more cloud out there. People had the problems we were solving were getting more pronounced. So product was getting better. Leadership style was getting better. Um, market was developing. And by the end of 2011, I remember, um, you know, like Q3 of that year, October of that year, we closed our, our, our quarter at the end of that quarter, at the end of that quarter. And I remember, you know, the deal, the, the target for the quarter was like $300,000 in ARR. And we did, you know, $315,000. It was like, it was like the best day of my life. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think um, exactly to your point, some of it, is a lot of hard work it obviously is but some of it also is timing and luck and that's something you've you've said a lot right you, you have to have sometimes a lot of these forces i am curious when you did start to feel repeatability right when did you feel like hey we really understand the sales motion and engine and what it takes to land customers consistently yeah it's it, like i said it's or like like a, my answer for another couple of questions it's not black and white i mean i still think today i mean i had a meeting two hours ago where we were talking about a certain segment and a certain product a certain geo it's like why isn't this repeatable <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, sir, no this, help this, one here on the call yeah you're complete you're, you're just the i don't know if it's scary or, or energizing but your company is always completely screwed up so no matter how big you get um <laughs> but so it's never black and white but the tw 2012 was was the year where it, it started to it, it went from like being pretty bad to being you know we were steadily meeting or exceeding our numbers and it was more of a like you know ad pipeline ad salespeople and you grow um, that was a pretty much a watershed year 2012 we also uh, that year we got a couple of key new leaders we had a new person joined to lead sales and we had a new president of technology join and we got a um you know it's when sequoia led the series c so 2012 was a um was a pretty amazing year yeah i know you said it's not black and white but it does feel like 2011 you know to 2012 was a pretty yeah uh, yeah pretty big flip so it, it just i just didn't want people to get the impression that i just sit back and turn the dials now no, I appreciate you, you again, being so honest um, about that journey. I, I, I have one last question. The questions are rolling in, so I want to get to everyone else's. But my last question to, for you is, is there anything looking back you would have done differently on your sales journey at Okta? Is there anything you would have done earlier? Is there something you think that other founders can learn from? Yeah, I think um, I mentioned before about saying no to some deals to, to, to get a signal, right? You, you, it's really about learning and iterating. And, and if you say no, you can, you can learn more than if you always drop price or always kind of do whatever it takes to get the deal. That's one thing. I also, the other thing too, is that um, I was really worried about changing people, you know, moving salespeople in and out, moving sales leaders in and out. I think that is part of just the learning. It's, it's something I wouldn't have been as kind of reticent to do. Um, and then the last thing I, I would reiterate too is that, especially in the early days, don't you have a lot of value just by the fact that you're focused on this problem and you're thinking about the problem to these companies and you can use that, right? You can use that to, you're not going to build a great company on that because you're going to have to follow that up with a great product and a scalable approach. But to get started and to get deals and to get customers going and to learn, it's really valuable. And don't, don't be shy about the value you can bring there. You're, you're more focused on this problem than anyone else, guarantee you, yeah. especially anyone else at these big companies. <laughs> that is that is such a good reminder. That and, of course, saying no. So both of those together. All yeah. right, we have some awesome, awesome questions here. I'm going to pick a few out. Um, so yeah, I, I, haven't been, I haven't been reading them, so you're going to have to read them out. Hi, Noah from Cloudflare. So large financial customers tend to be tight-lipped until you are an existing vendor, especially when discussing their security concerns. What tips do you have to get them to open up what's important to them so you can focus on consultative selling? It's an interesting question, Noah. Um, by the way, I think Cloudflare is a great company. So congratulations on that working there. Um, I, you know, we, it's interesting. We, we actually, when we were early in, in starting out these stories I'm telling, people didn't think about us as security. It was mostly like uh, employee productivity and 
um, enablement, like get an app deployed, productivity of existing investment, you know, get that app deployed to everyone and so forth. And it wasn't really a security. I, partly that's because I think we were scared to have the security conversation because we didn't want to say like, oh, we don't want to get in the conversation of the cloud is insecure. What if you get hacked? All that stuff. Um, so we somewhat avoided this challenge. Um, but that's in that a lot right, right around 2012 or 2013, it was like changed dramatically. We were, it was like cloud was here. You needed to have a, a good auth authentication authorization system to get a handle around it. And a way it, like today, you know, probably 65% of our deals are led by the chief security officer. Um, so I don't know, it's like not from experience, but my gut would say for an early company, try to leverage that you know, try to leverage that, you know, to get credibility with these big companies, try to leverage your personal expertise and the, you know, the personal, um, what you can bring to that company and improving their security posture from your product, but also just from your own knowledge and try to use that as a way into the door. Awesome. Here's another a great question. Uh, I it really, I think demonstrates how enterprise focused our audience is. How do you think about navigating between your key user for whom you're solving their number one problem and your buyer who might be further removed from the problem within the org you're selling into? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, another really good question. Um, so the, one of the ways we've, we've really kept this focus on the end user is really being focused on adoption and not, not getting too excited about a, a sale per se than about a deployed sale and a deployed sale that's used because that aligns these two things, right? Because if the product's not usable and giving value to end users, the, the buyer may be happy because the deal is purchased, but it's not gonna be sustainable. So us and the user and the buyer are all aligned in there because we want a multi-year subscription, right? That renews and expands and it's not just about doing one deal. And I think that one of the things about cloud, I mean, people love cloud and everyone talks about subscription, but one of the simplest things is that it's, it, it aligns the vendor long-term orientation with the customer, which I think is a very health, healthy thing, especially in this dynamic you're talking about. Great. All right, Todd, how do you think about, this is a good one and it goes back to, you know, your customer focus that you mentioned in the early days, but also paired with the fact that you're selling to very large customers, right? So there is, uh, you know, how do you think about building to vision versus building to specific customer needs in early days? You know, how do you balance driving product adoption versus building new features? This is something we see a lot of our smaller companies, you know, you end up building to spec for one or two large companies versus, a, you know, a broader product. I was really, I was actually really worried about this. And it's one of the reasons why we started Okta trying to go to market heavily with SMB. I figured, you know, it's like my Salesforce experience. If we, if we, when I was at Salesforce, it was basically an SMB company. They really started to do enterprise stuff after I left. Um, but so I, I was worried about this. I didn't want to be bespoke and build a, you know, a system for just one company. So that's why we started with SMB. I think we were lucky in that we got, before we started going enterprise, I think customer 50 or hundred was probably like when the enterprise push really started. Um, so that's 2012, 2013 and so forth. The, I think that the, we had enough, right? We had 12 customers, right? And that was enough, right? And let, don't get, don't, I mean, make no mistake. We did some custom stuff for specific companies. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, I can think of examples, you know, we built some pretty, especially like connecting to on-premise systems and things. We, we did some custom, we did some specific stuff, but we had enough customers. We had 12 customers, 20 customers, 50 customers that it was always not the main thing. Um, so I would say like, you don't need a thousand customers, but you need 15, right? Um, to, to not get stuck in that motion. Uh, yeah, and I think that, um, the other thing I was going to say when the question was asked that popped into my mind was we were actually, we weren't that good at vision selling. We were like super tactical. Like, here's what we have. Here's what we're about. Here's what it does. Um, you know, is this going to work for you? And I can think of a bunch of deals that we walked away from because we didn't have like the roadmap. Like we, we could have said, Oh, it's on the roadmap. It's coming, but we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to set them up to be disappointed. Um, it's a balance, right? It's it's uh, vision selling, roadmap selling versus not. I, I think we probably should have done more of that actually. 
um, I, yeah, we probably should have been more like, you know, especially when we got to the 100 customers, 200 customers, we should have done more of like, here's where it's going, clearly laying that out and just demarcate, demarking like, this is what we have today. We don't have this yet, but here's where we're going. And here's the vision. And here's why you should invest in it. And here's like why we're the platform for the future. And what happened later on is we really have, we've really evolved in this platform message, which is, which is we're going to be the one identity thing for all of your use cases, you know? what stuff you want to build yourself for websites, mobile apps for employees, we can do it all. Yeah. And it's extensible, it's customizable, infinite integrations, um, unlimited use cases. That's been our message. So it got there. But I think in you know, 2013, 2012, we probably could have done more of like, here's the vision. Yeah. I think the question is always how early you do these things, right? Because at some point you do want, you do want to push the envelope, but the question is just when and how you prioritize it, you know, with the resources you have. And, and this question is actually one that a lot of our early stage startups think about, which is um, does Octa sell direct or work with channel partners, you know, resellers? Um, if it's a mix of both, how does a channel partner add value and, and what makes it worthwhile to consider partnering with them? You know, because I think a lot of early stage startups are pulled into this early early on, maybe when they're not quite ready yet. So curious when Okta really went down this motion. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a combination. Like we have all kinds of partners and channel programs, but it's basically direct, right? Our our channel is really a, like a sourcing, like source the deal and then like help close the deal. And maybe sometimes help with the contract terms and the paper, like the MSA and stuff on their paper or our paper. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it's direct. And it's, you know, a lot of, especially in the security space, Noah from Cloudflare probably knows this, that the, a lot of the, traditionally the security channel, like the firewalls and the boxes and the, and the threat detection, all that stuff was very much channel centric. Um, but we're not like that. We're, we're, we're very direct. And I think that's, sometimes it, it's slower to scale that out, but I think it's a big advantage because you have more of a relationship. You can, once you get bigger, you can kind of, um, you know, buy things that you can then sell through your channel and so forth. Um, and it's worked out pretty well for us. Awesome. This is a good one. We didn't really talk about marketing, right? Because, so, and you've talked about this a lot, which is all around category creation, how you weren't sure in the early days if you were actually creating a new category, if it was just a smaller, cheaper category. So how did your marketing and positioning change when you transitioned from the SMB to enterprise? They're very different value props. Of course, we talked about all the, the customer testimonials, but were there any other tactics or playbook pages specifically on category creation? Yeah, my advice my advice on this, um, that's mostly for really early stage entrepreneurs or early stage companies, is that the um, it's really scary to, to be out there on your own in terms of a category early on. Like it's scary to be the only identity company, cloud identity, security in the cloud. It, that was scary. And there's a big, um, there's a lot of temptation to try to, you know, surf a different trend or, or be a category that was more established or something. Um, and I remember like really worried about like, should we be this alone independent and like making this identity in the cloud category? And it was a little bit scary, but it actually, that's I think what you should lean into because it's really the only chance you have to build, to build a breakout success. You have to go through that pain and you have to be the only person because what happens is that if you're right, if you get lucky, if the trends are going your way and if they're, you know, for us, if there's enough cloud and if there's enough apps and security really is something that's gonna be trusted in the cloud, then it switches relatively quickly. It switches from you're the one lone person out there in this new category to being this category is important. And now by the way, you're the leader, right? And for us, it was like, we were out there saying, this is the way, this is the future identity in the cloud. It's gonna be, you know, the future is not active directory on your firewall the future is like cloud identity and it was scary and people didn't believe it but then all of a sudden microsoft announced a completing competing product in 2014 it was like wait a minute we went from being this thing that maybe not worked to being something that was so important the biggest software company in the world had to own it right yeah that was the moment right you're like oh we we're, we're in this right <laughs> yeah it was like it was like it's flipped and as painful as it was and scary as it was early, it's as much of an advantage as it was once it flipped. Yeah, this is a great question. Again, with that security you know, lens on, how do you talk about creating and measuring value or ROI for your customers since security often gets turned into checkboxes? Um, yeah. You know, the best products can obviously measure value beyond that. How do you think about this? Well, I, we were, um, 
I don't know if we're accurate or right, but we're tried and we're systematic about it. <laughs> um, you know, we have like a, a team. It's funny. We, we, this is about the time when we, we went through that value selling exercise that um, when I, from the customer perspective and thinking about the customer benefits, which by the way, when you, when you say that out loud, like take the other person's perspective, so, you know, sell to them what they want to, what they're trying to solve. It sounds so friggin' obvious. I mean, it's like, any relationship or any conversation with a person, it's the kind of thing you should do, right? Um, but it's often overlooked. But anyways, my point about the, um, the we, we, about that same time, what we did this thing called business value assessments, which was this crazy idea the team had that they wanted to do. They're like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a spreadsheet that we're going to put all these numbers into about how much money we're saving the customer and how valuable this is. And we put all of them in there and then we give it to the customer to justify how much value they're getting from Okta. And I'm like, what? Like, we're going to make the spreadsheet and they're going to believe us. Um, but it worked like <laughs> just by quantifying it and like maybe the exact number they didn't believe, but at least they knew now the list is it's this many password resets. It's this much of a security breach. It's going to cost you. You're going to get this app rolled out. And I mean, it's just the fact that you listed them out and it was in this document. It worked. So I don't know if there's a magic answer, but I think the more um, kind of discreet or the more um, explicit you can be about it and clear, the ch more chance you have to getting a common conception with the customer prospect about what you're delivering. Yeah, I think to your point, it is maybe a little counterintuitive, right? Uh, but the value-based pricing or well, like calculators that we've seen with a lot of our other enterprise companies really gets you on the same page with the customer uh, a lot of times. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I love this last question um, from Alan. Um, I've tried to sell a new category several times. <laughs> Too often you're not selling into existing budget. Any advice for finding maybe adjacent bu budget? That's a great question. I'm curious the initial budget that you were able to pull out of um, when you first started and how that's evolved. I think if you, um, I think it's not, totally like this all the time. But if you, I think if you go find existing budget, you're not creating a new category. So you should be careful of that. I think it's not, it's like almost a positive signal if there's no budget for what you're doing. And the reality is, is like, you don't, they'll find budget, right? They can find it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Unless you're selling like some $50 million deal. Um, like for us, for example, a lot of our deals, the budget came early on, the budget came from it was like in the box rollout or in the, in the workday rollout, right? They would find a few hundred grand from that. So that was the fact that we were, they found a budget and eventually we built the category. So that now there is a budget for IDAS, you know, identity management as a service. Um, anyway, that's how I think about that. Yeah. Again, again, counterintuitive, but which I feel like is maybe the theme of today's yeah. talk. But, um, but yeah, one thing I should say too, is like, is one of the great things about building a company is that you have to build it and nothing I say is law or, or sacrosanct. I mean, it's input and you can think about it and how it works for your business, how it doesn't, um, but you have to make your own decisions. Yeah, and, and that's why we so appreciate your time today. I think exactly to that point, you know, my founders have said, look, no one else can tell me how to run my company. My journey is gonna be my own, but I can at least learn from others and hear stories and, um, and, and um, along the way, uh, learn some great things. So thank you so, so much, Todd, for your time today. We try to get through as many questions as possible. I know for those I have people yelling at me and saying, please answer my question. So um, hit Todd up, uh, I think on Twitter, you're so active. Yeah. At Todd McKinnon, yeah. Uh, my DMs are open or you can just tweet me. I, I look at that all. I appreciate the questions. I love talking to enterprise, so. We love it too. So thank you, huge, huge thank you again, Todd, for all this knowledge drop. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining today. We'll see you next month at our February New York Enterprise Tech Meetup. Uh, be sure to sign up for our Enterprise Weekly Newsletter for more enterprise events. Uh, and everyone take care. Thank you so much again, Todd. Bye, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> take care. Have a good day, everyone.